All right, so my presentation today is called The Critical 5%. Um, as I said, my name is Randall Brass. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Impulse Software. And I'm here from Eugene, Oregon in the United States. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. You're always welcome to come visit. It's a beautiful green place similar to this, but we have pine trees instead of uh, the trees that you have. So. For those of you who don't know, Impulse has been partnered with NAP for nearly 15 years. It says 13 years there, but I think it's a little longer than that, certainly for how long we've been working together. Um, and InApp has been our sole development team for the last three major revisions of our application. Our product simply is a web-based .NET uh, application which provides a pretty front end to a SQL Server backend. That's really all it does. We solve a business problem with a database and a front end. Um, the product is used all over the world by many different types of organizations for managing their maintenance operations. So we're talking about building maintenance and equipment maintenance, machine maintenance, manufacturing companies, schools, hospitals, a place like this certainly um, might use Impulse as well to manage their maintenance operations. Impulse is the primary day-to-day -day management tool used by maintenance professionals for keeping track of what they have done, what they need to do, and then reporting on all of those results. So my job at Impulse is a really varied job. I'm the chief technology officer, and yes, absolutely, First and foremost is our products, which is where I work with NF. But I am also responsible for our IT infrastructure and our hosting environment and all of the people that go along with that on my IT team. Um, I am also responsible for our customer service and support. Over 60% of our revenue is annual renewals of maintenance agreements. And so our service and support in making customers happy is the most important thing that we do every day. And so it's a really big focus of my job. I'm also responsible for our training and our implementation teams who go out into the world and they help people learn to use Impulse. They teach them how to manage their own operations using Impulse, and they go all over the world to do that. In fact, I have one of my team who's in the north of India this week working with a plant up there who's working to implement Impulse. So we're both here in India at the same time. So that's kind of unusual for us. We have somebody going to Tanzania next week, so we're all over the world. Um, I mentioned all these rules to help you understand really that I'm not only focused on technology. Uh, my presentation is more about business as a whole, and it's something I'm very passionate about with our team, and they've certainly heard me talk about it. This slide really, um, I put it here because I knew Chris was going to put one here. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, it's, not, it's not just to brag about the customers that we have, but I do want you to see the diversity of these customers and all the different types of organizations that they work with because it helps to lend credence to what I'm going to talk to you about, is all these different kinds of companies that we work with. And it's one of the best parts of my job. Um, in a typical day, I get to talk to people who are working at a manufacturing plant, who are at a military base, who are in a school, in a university. Every day I get to talk to people who are in all these different industries. And I get a lot of exposure to all levels of customers. I talk to people at the C-level, I talk to managers, I talk to mid-level managers, I talk to people who are nurses who are just requesting maintenance, and I get a lot of feedback from all of those organizations and all of those types of users on what's important. And I've learned something that I want to share with you today. I call it the critical 5%. And I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking to you about it and what it means. But before we get to that, I don't want you to get hung up on the number five. Okay? Really, I was putting together this presentation and I thought, I need a catchy name for this. Let's call it the critical 5%. So the number doesn't really matter. It's about average for us 5% of time that we spend in a development project, but your projects obviously may be different. Um, so let's talk first about what I mean by the critical 5%. And I've come up with some examples here of projects to help you illustrate the concept. So here's a project has some requirements, it's probably a bit outside the scope of what you normally work on, right? The stakeholders who propose this project give us four requirements which have all clearly been met, right? The requirements are complete, the functional testing is complete, the door is open and closed, the windows do what windows do. The roof is clearly attached to the walls, this project's complete, right? Not yet. It's ready for that critical 5%. Got it? Everybody clear? No. Okay, so one more example. I'm in India. Let me give you an Indian example. The actress development project. Okay? So clearly, this actress has met all of the requirements for being a Bollywood movie star, right? No. She needs the critical 5%. Right? One more. One more, and then I'm sure you're going to be able to get it. 
This is what I call the U.S. President Development Project. Okay? Seemingly, this, this result meets all of the requirements to be a president, but it definitely needs the critical 5%. Much better. Much better. So clearly, I'm, I'm tongue-in-cheek. Let's move this into software development, and, and maybe I can make it a little more clear in a software development context. Okay, so to the basics, then. Here we have kind of the breakdown of the approximate or average amount of each portion of a software development project. Now, clearly, these percentages are going to vary. This is really average for us at Impulse, how much time we spend in each of these major phases. I clearly understand there's a lot more to software development than these. I've oversimplified, okay? But what I want to talk about is up at the top, that 5% at the very top, that I call the critical 5%. Jay reminded me in the past that I called it fit and finish, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So it's this fit and finish which gives us not just a solution to the functional requirements, but a finished product which is exceptional, professional, and ready for the marketplace. This is effort, it's above and beyond the design work, the research, the QA, the development, it's the work which has helped to make Impult one of the most successful software companies in our industry. Um, this is the work which makes a software development project more than something fun to show your friends and brag about your code and, and say, hey mom, look what I did. This is the work that makes your software commercially viable, makes it something that you can sell in the marketplace for real dollars. It's the critical 5% is the laser focus on the end user's overall journey through your application. As you all know, I'm sure you all know, our friend Bajoy over here and his team make fantastic UI, UX designs. They do an incredible amount of work and they do a great job. They are wizards at making product designs. That's really what they're responsible for impulse, honestly. And she was nice enough to say that I designed it, but no, it was Bajoy and his team which have absolutely done it. Thank you. But there is often, and I'm sure most of you have seen this, there's a gap that happens between Bajoy's design and the actual implementation of the thing. Or, more commonly for us, because I've been doing this for 23 years, we're on the ninth version of Impulse, the design versus the 23rd time that we've implemented that design. There's a gap that occurs. Things change, things get moved, things get moved around, minor mistakes, omissions, and things maybe that you thought someone else was going to correct, you're just moving on to get your bug fixed. Right? So this problem really gets exacerbated by companies like mine who are doing long-term development projects, over two million lines of code, I don't know how many different screens we have, but we'll go in and we'll create a new feature that we think is the greatest, coolest thing, and we've modified the user design. We've modified the interface in this place, but we haven't gone back and made changes to the rest of the interface. So there are lots and lots of different examples of this. I put up through the things that that Shampoo and the team are sick of hearing me talk about. Um, but these are the things that, that I really focus on. And I want to call two of them out because they're things that we've actually worked on this week that I want to point out to you. First and foremost, and this is one that's a serious pet peeve of mine, and this is a gross example of it, is layout inconsistency. So this week we reviewed a project to fix the layout inconsistency at Impulse. These, these three images are screen grabs from Impulse, and you can see the first two are clearly following exactly the same consistent design. The third one is not. Why that happened, I don't recall. It's an area of the program that we just didn't go back to. We just didn't get it to follow up to the new design, the new layout. But what I have learned over time is that this is the kind of thing that makes people dislike your software. It creates a level of friction in their mind as they're moving through your application that they develop a negative feeling. They may not even be able to articulate to you what it is that they don't like about your application. It's just a little bit of irritation. And this is a gross example. This is clearly different. But the thing that we see sometimes is that a button moves just a couple of pixels to the left or the right. Or you make one field just a little wider than the rest of the fields. Or you're using um, names in the software that don't have spaces. Right? That's shampoo, and I had a lot of, lot of conversations about that this week. So those little things are really the things that you need to look for as part of that critical 5% to make sure that you don't create those negative feelings in your customer and your end user. The other area I want to talk about, and this is my personal nemesis, is error messages, failure messages, operational problems that you need to get back to the user. 
And so I come up, if you will, imagine, if you will, that this young man is your end user. And I'm sorry that Anoop is not here today because this is his son. <laughs> so imagine that this young man was your end user and you've asked him to do something in your software, perform a task that your software is absolutely designed to do. It has exactly that feature in it. He's not trying to do anything weird. But something goes wrong. Some kind of a mistake happens. Something doesn't work the way you expected it to do. What am I supposed to say to this young man when that happens? Do I just stare blankly into his eyes and let a spinning wheel show on the screen? Is that what I do? Or do I look at him and I say, well, error 512, the server has returned an invalid response. Or, even better, I could just lay down on the floor and wait for him to reboot and refresh me. Right? Those are all things that happen, and those are things that destroy the user experience. What you need to do, you need to make sure that your response is take this handsome young man by the hand and you say, terribly sorry, something's gone wrong, let's see if we can sort this out together. That's what you want your user experience to look like. No matter what the error message is, they need to have that feeling that you're taking them by the hand and helping them not cause that problem again. And it's, through all of my years of software development, it is something that is missed so many times. The, the user experience with error or failure conditions is so critical to making sure your user doesn't get that negative feeling of response to working in your application. So these are just two examples from this list. I'm not going to go too much further into that. I don't want to go into every detail. I think you get the point. Um, now let's talk about why this matters. And I'm going to warn you, this is probably not the reason that you're thinking of, okay? But I'm going to go into it anyway. So you remember this slide from earlier, this is our development effort, these are the percentages of time that we split into the development effort, and we all feel strongly about, you know, you need to have more QA, or you need to have more development, or you need to have more research and innovation. You know how your end user looks at this when they look at what's important to them? Like that. They care more about the look and the feel of your product and that it functions properly than they do about features, than they do about what your tech is. If you're in business, they assume you have the features that you say you're going to have. What they want to see is that it works, and it works well, and it works smoothly. And that's the first and foremost thing that they choose when they're deciding to buy software. I'll tell you for us, what the customer looks for in the first few minutes of their experience with the product is critical. So here at Impulse, I've been doing this since 1996, and when I started in 1996, I had close to 250 different competitors. Uh, similar kind of to where Chris is. I had a lot of companies doing a lot of different things. Over the last five years, maybe ten years, the investment into my space has left five companies. Five legitimate companies doing the type of maintenance software that I'm doing. Every single prospect that we talk to looks at a demo from every single one of these products. They see our screens next to their screens and they, they make comparisons like that. And if we haven't focused on that fit and finish, on that detail, if at any point we create that little negative seed of feeling about the software because my layout was inconsistent, I will lose that prospect. I will not be able to sell that customer. And if the fit and finish is what's important to the end user, the customer, then it has to be important to us as the development team. This is because the most important part of software development, and you're going to hate hearing this, I'm telling you, you're not going to like this part. The most important part of software development is not the technology, it is not the innovation, and it is not how awesome your code is. The most important of software development, the most important part of software development is that you can sell your software. Nothing ever happens until somebody buys something. And that's the most important part of it. And there's an old adage from our founder, Steve Browse, my father, who was here in 2011. Many of you know him. It's something that he tells every single one of our employees, every single one of our managing partners, every single one of our vendors, that they all have the same job title. And I'd like you all to think that you have the same job title. Unemployed unless I sell software. Okay? And I very clearly use the term I in this acronym. It is not a we. Every single one of us needs to look at what we're doing in software development and think about how we can impact the ability to sell software. Even the people who bring me coffee in the morning when I'm here at Inno, that's part of that process of making sure that the software that we sell is, software we make is saleable. And that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it made sense to you. I really, I'll, 
especially would like to take a chance to just call out the people on my team who I've gotten a great chance to work with this week, as well as all of the rest of you. There's so many people at this company that I've gotten a chance to work with over the years. I don't work with you every day, but I see so many faces that I recognize, so many, you know, this week there's been so many of you that come to me and said, oh, we worked on this software demo, or we worked on this thing. I've been working with you for over 13 years. And so there's so many of you that have thanked that I, I just want to tell you, without NAP, our company would not be the company that it is. And I'm incredibly grateful for everything you guys do.